Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Dave Petey, as I said, uh, Publishing Professionals Network. We are an all volunteer nonprofit. Um, if you are not a PPN uh, member, you are certainly welcome here, um, but I strongly encourage that you check us out. Um, we'll put the URL in the chat and we'll also, for those who are watching on a video, uh, we'll make sure that we include it uh, in the description as well as a lot of other information that's going to be provided uh, tonight. So don't worry about taking notes, it'll all be there. Um, so uh, think about joining um, Publishing Professionals Network. It's $25 a, e a year. It's very reasonable. And if that's um, a stretch for you, please reach out to us. We can, I'm sure we can make it work. Um, but I wanted to do a couple of housekeeping things before we get to tonight's topic. Uh, the first one is that we are really excited that registration has opened for our in-person publishing um, professional network conference 2023. It's on April 21st at the David Brower Center in Berkeley, California. We're gonna have, that's a, just a giant networking opportunity. So it really feels appropriate to talk about that uh, tonight. The other thing I want to say is that, um, you know, PPN is really about supporting the co community, connecting with community. Every month on the third Thursday, we have a Zoom, um, sort of a, a Zoom session uh, just for people to connect. It's really nothing more. It's fun. I come with a cocktail. Uh, it's at 5.30. Uh, so people are sort of you know, done with the day and ready to ready to um, to in, enjoy each other's company in a more relaxed atmosphere. We used to do those in person. COVID uh, forced us to go on Zoom. And we've done a few sessions in person since then, um, but we are still loving the Zoom. Um, even though a lot of people are burned out on Zoom, it seems to be a great way for people to connect uh, for a lot of other reasons. Okay, so tonight's session we are really excited about, uh, mainly because, you know, network is in our name. And sometimes we're not that great here at PPN about figuring out the best ways for us to um, uh, support the community connecting with each other. Um, and I think that's because there are so many different ways to do it. Um, everybody is different in terms of what works for them. Uh, and I was really thrilled because Linda, uh, one of the presenters tonight, uh, reached out to me after um, joining one of our sessions. I think it was the PDF, the one about PDF markup, if I'm not mistaken. Um, which was a great session, and uh, said, you know, this is a, we we just worked on a book about the very um, the very concept around how, how to network uh, specifically in 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 publishing, but in in general, I think we can all use support uh, in figuring out ways to connect with each other. So I'm not going to go on much longer. Um, I really just I'm going to let our two presenters um, introduce themselves and also. Um, talk a little bit about the structure, but know that this is roughly going to be 50 minutes. We're going to do Q&A, but we're going to do it at the end. We've got a lot of people who are going to be joining, and it's hard to manage questions in the chat uh, midstream. So do keep track of your questions, but add them uh, after the presentation is done, if that is okay. Okay. So if I can, I'm going to try to pin our two presenters so that you can see them and you don't have to uh, just look at me if I can. And while Dave pins us, um, I just want to have like a big shout out in terms of networking to the Editorial Freelancers Association that one of your PPN members posted on there. Somebody else posted um, on IBPA also. And um, it's, you know, it was mentioned also at the Women in Publishing Summit last week, which was amazing. So massive networking for this session. Um, I think, Dave, you said we had 225 people signed up for today. Uh, it was wonderful. And all thanks to all the connections and all of you that made it possible. And I see a lot of familiar faces, which I love. So um, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Oops, here we go. Okay. Am I sharing the right screen? Yes, I am. Yes. Okay. Okay, so first of all, thank you all for being here when you could be at home having a wonderful dinner or a cocktail with friends at a bar or something. We really appreciate that you chose to spend this one hour with us. My name is Linda Ruggeri, and I'm a freelance, full service, full time nonfiction editor based out of Los Angeles. And I specialize in memoir and biographies in cookbooks 
And I also review and copy edit Spanish translations, and I'm also Latinx. And my, my name is Brittany Dowdle, and I'm a full-time freelance copy editor and proofreader based in the North Georgia mountains. And I specialize in fiction and creative nonfiction. So our presentation today is based on this workbook that Brittany and I created and that was published about a year and a half ago. And the book is based on our combined years of experience as freelance editors, but also as the time that we spend volunteering and running the welcome program for the Editorial Freelancers Association um, that was under the umbrella of the diversity initiative. And you might think that because there's the word editor in the title of our book that this presentation is just for editors, but absolutely not. We switched this one around to make it more for the publishing industry and for all the different people who we rely on to be able to get books out there and materials out there, which is all of you. So we are going to share some key points of what we think are important networking points um, that you can start implementing today, right after our meeting. But above all, you could really start implementing it at the upcoming PPI, PPN conference in Berkeley on April 21st. So um, one last thing, there is an accessibility note that I wanted to share here that we did create a transcript, a transcript that accompanies this recording that um, PPN will send out to members for download. And it does include alt text on each slide if that is helpful to some of you, okay? So, the goals of our presentation today are to help you create your own collaborative, incremental, but long-term approach to networking. Because in our experience, the most effective approach to networking and what has brought us the most success as editors and as authors has been this way of thinking of networking. So we want you to be able to redefine your idea of networking and what that means to you to identify your business goals, you know, both the short-term ones and the long-term ones. And if you've been, you know, participating in these PPN meetings or if you've been to other conferences, we know that, you know, after these conferences, we all have some goals or before the conference, we have some goals of what we're hoping to accomplish when we go to them. We hope that by the end of this meeting, you're gonna be like, hmm, maybe I need to evaluate my current network. And that above all, that you're going to discover your personal networking style. So Brittany and I are going to persuade you to think of networking in a fresh way, in a positive way, and a way that's based on what you already know how to do and what you already do really well. So let's get started. And um, this slide comes about that I was listening to somebody who was kind of inspiring me to some business goals and... I'm just going to put this out there that um, this person said, you know, the best time, the, I'm sorry, if you want to be unsuccessful and never reach your goals, the best time to start is tomorrow. So I'm going to drop there and then we're going to keep on moving. And Brittany, this slide, I'm going to pass it over to you. All right. Thanks, Linda. So the first step in our process is to redefine our idea of networking. And if you're coming to publishing from other industries or from maybe a very competitive academic environment, our approach might be a little different from the networking mindset that you're used to, but the approach we're sharing is what Linda and I have found to be the most effective and well-received um, style of networking in the publishing industry. So then for the next 50 minutes or so, we just ask for you to kind of set aside your preconceived ideas about what networking is and what it means, and to just have the curiosity of a cat contemplating a light bulb on a string. And as Linda knows, I have cat assistants. And so if you have cats, you know what I'm talking about. I'm hoping none of them will make an appearance tonight because they, it, Zoom is like a magnet to them. So hopefully <laughs> we're okay tonight. Um, okay, back to you, Linda. Okay, so let's redefine networking with a story. And we have a lot of stories of how networking has enriched our lives and has strengthened our businesses and has given us community support and encouragement. So it was really hard to narrow it down to pick like one story that we could tell you and share with you about how things have worked out for us. But we like this story because it shows how generous networking can bring both tangible benefits, but also intangible benefits. So here's my story. 
it was um it was 2015 and i had just moved back to los angeles after living in wisconsin for three years i was a mom to a three-year-old son and i had a husband that had a very demanding job so he was rarely home and i kind of felt like i was freelancing you know also in the mom role <laughs> Um, I had a freelance editing job for about three years, but I didn't have a lot of focus or a niche at that time. And I also didn't have a website. I didn't have a directory. I'm so embarrassed to say this now, but I didn't have a directory profile anywhere. Um, and the email address that I had was a Gmail address that used my nickname in my year of birth. So I know some of you might be able to relate to that. But I also didn't belong to any professional editorialist associations. Um, and I didn't really know other, you know, official or professional editors. I wasn't going to conferences. I wasn't collaborating with anyone in the industry. Um, and I was kind of flying solo most of the time and trying to figure things out on the go. And, and you know, why was I surprised that I wasn't getting a lot of work? <laughs> but then one day I was online, you know, searching for classes that I could take to help, you know, build my, not only my editing skills, but my business skills too, as a freelancer. And I came across an editorial organization um, here in the U.S. And I read everything and I decided, you know what, I'm just going to join. And I joined and then I just started scouring the website and reading everything that they had there. I also, you know, looked at the discussion list because they have a very interactive discussion list and to see if there were any editors that lived in my area because I didn't really know anybody. And somebody replied and said that they did. So we exchanged a couple of emails off list and agreed to meet for coffee here in the area one day. And this to me was a little bit nerve wracking because I felt, you know, here I'm going to go to this coffee kind of date and I don't really have a lot to offer this person, this experienced editor. But I really wanted to learn more and I wanted to know how are they doing it and how are they being successful. I kind of wanted to learn the way of the editor. So what should have been like a one hour meeting with a cup of coffee turned into three hours or to what me felt like the whole morning. And I remember specifically coming back home and telling my husband that night that you're not going to believe all the information that I got. You know, I had this huge, you know, this one page full of notes and things that I needed to do. And it turned out that that other editor that I met with was also a writer. A different kind of writer but also a writer and that meeting for coffee for me became so many things because this person made me feel understood and supported and they made me feel guided and encouraged because of the feedback they were giving me and with that my imposter syndrome you know that was huge when i went to the meeting kind of started to disappear and this one person with this one meeting became like my go-to point of contact for all of the things that were related to editing. And they didn't notice, but it was kind of like my unofficial mentor. And then two weeks later, she moved out of state. And I freaked out because I thought, oh my God, no. The one person that I know, the one connection that I made just left the state, you know, here we go back to square one. But that's what my mind was telling me. And it was really wrong because that friendship that developed at that one meeting was a door that opened paths in so many different directions. And that person was actually Brittany Dowdle, my co-author. So because at that time, Brittany was working already with EFA and with the Diversity Initiative, she invited me to join the group. And I could have said no, because I had no idea what the group was about or what they were doing. But I said yes, because exactly that. I didn't know anything about it. And if Brittany was inviting me, it was probably because she saw something there that had value and that could have had value for me. And I joined, and after attending a lot of these, you know, monthly DI meetings, as a lurker, um, I really wasn't commenting or doing anything, And I, but I was also attending the local meetings here in Los Angeles. Brittany asked me if I would help her run uh, the welcome program for the diversity initiative. And that program, basically what it did, it would welcome new members of the organization into the organization by pairing them up with an existing member so they could help, you know, this new member navigate the whole organization better and really take advantage of the benefits that it offered. And Brittany, I remember specifically, she said to me, I can't do it alone, but if you're willing to co-direct the program with me, I think we can do a great job together. And, you know, the first thing that came up was imposter syndrome, like, there's no way you could never co-direct a program, you're new to the organization, you're new to this group. 
But again, I trusted that if Brittany had invited me to do this, it was because she felt I could do this. And it was just too good of an opportunity to pass. So we did, I did join Brittany in co-directing and, you know, here we are five years later with the book and I still run the welcome program for EFA and we're trying to give other people that are new to the publishing industry and they're new to editing or new to, you know, authoring their own books and to self-publishing that experience that we didn't have when we started. We wanted them to feel welcome and supportive and that they're, you know, we are listening. So here we are five years later, we've each grown our businesses. We've supported, you know, one another through thick and thin. We've volunteered so many hours together and we've written, you know, an award-winning book. Um, our book got the Benjamin Franklin Award at IBPA, the silver medal last year. And we're hoping that with the work that we're doing, we're able to support other editors, other authors, other writers out there to find their own networking style and their own success. So Brittany, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Okay, thank you, Linda. So when Linda originally shared this story with me, which was really only in the past year, I was kind of blown away because I knew what that meeting meant for me and how working with Linda has really energized me to take on projects that are outside of my comfort zone. But I didn't know how much our simple networking coffee date had helped her as well. And so what we like to point out here is that, you know, that first meeting that we had was fun, it was relaxing, it was informative, and it was absolutely networking. And yet most of us are used to thinking of networking as things like, you know, collecting business cards at a conference and then they end up in a drawer that we never see again, or following people on social media and then just liking their posts but lurking in the background, or, you know, we click the connect button on LinkedIn, but we don't really take the time to get to know the other person, find out what their story is, or even, you know, send a short message saying, hey, this is, you know, this is how I know you, or I read your blog post, and I'd really love to connect. Um, or maybe sometimes we just focus on getting introductions to people who have standing in our industry um, so we can get work from them. But when these are the things that we focus on, we often avoid networking because it feels uncomfortable or aimless or self-serving. But what we found is that if we can shift our focus and really reimagine networking, it will shift our results as well. So while business cards and social media do have a place, for us, true intentional networking is so much more than that. And that's why the first thing that we'll focus on today is reframing our idea of networking. Okay. So I'm on the wrong side, am I not, Brittany? I we all of a sudden I jumped to slide 28. <laughs> we need to advance two more, I think. Okay, let's go back here. Pardon me, people. Close your eyes. <laughs> back to the future. Okay, so one more. Wait. There go we go. More? There we go. Okay. Okay. So then um, so as part of redefining networking, we like to start with the definition of networking from Merriam-Webster. Linda and I are both editors. So of course, at some point, we're going to have dictionaries and style guides <laughs> in our presentations. Um, but so the, the definition is the exchange of information or services among individuals, groups, or institutions. And if you're like many of the people that we've talked to, who dread networking or who say, you know, networking is awkward and it's uncomfortable, it's probably because you're used to the kind of traditional networking that's described here, which is the exchange of information or services. And that's clearly transactional. And, you know, don't get us wrong, transactions are a necessary part of business and, and we understand that. But transactional networking won't really build the kind of network that we as editors and publishing professionals need. So then the more precise definition listed just below, um, it's a little bit closer to our needs, which is the cultivation of productive relationships for employment or business. And that's helpful, but we like to go one step further. So based on our experience and our kind of community-minded approach, we define networking as behavior that builds a web of mutually beneficial relationships. 
And the benefits we're talking about here are not just the monetary benefits or job opportunities that are the focus of traditional transactional networking. For us, part of reframing networking is realizing and recognizing the value of the intangible benefits it can provide. And these are things you can't put a price on, but they really affect how quickly you reach your goals and how, how stressful that process is. And this includes things like having a safe place for discussion, boosting our learning by sharing our experiences with others, and having support and encouragement from people who are working through the same challenges or who are maybe on the same career paths. So if you think back to the story that Linda just told, you know, we were both looking to connect on a more personal level with another editor who understood our challenges and who is navigating um, similar challenges and in terms of growing our businesses and being the best editors that, that we can be. Um, but we met over a comfortable cup of coffee and chocolate croissants. We sometimes call this the chocolate croissant method of networking. <laughs> um, and, you know, there were there were no business suits or transactional expectations involved. And really that morning, there was no pressure, which I think is one of the reasons that we connected the way that we did and as quickly as we did. We were both very relaxed and just interested in being there and learning about each other and sharing kind of our love for for both editing, but also sort of having our own businesses and kind of navigating that path. So this kind of networking, which has worked for us in, in many different situations, is based on cultivating authentic relationships. And you know that's really hard to do when you're uncomfortable and when you're feeling salesy. So instead, what we've learned is that you have to be present and you have to be engaged and ask yourself not just, you know, how can networking with this person help me, but how can I help them? And how can we find success together? And that, that openness and generosity really are key to our approach to networking. And I'm just going to say that our chocolate croissant budget is out of the roof. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so networking can take many forms and often it's our attitude and how we show up and interact with others that determines whether, for instance, an online class like that Adobe Acrobat that I took here with PPN, you know, was just an opportunity to learn specific skills and content or whether it's also a chance to build our professional network. And when we think of network as something natural that we do a little bit every day, every week, by being open and by seeking meaningful connections, then many of these daily activities become networking activities because they we inevitably grow our network and we continue to build community. So networking can be a lot of different things. It can be creating resources for others that maybe you post on your blog or you include in your newsletter or you post on the Slack space of PPN or other organizations, you know, this can help others get to know you and your writing or your editing style or your, you know, how you do graphic designs, which is a great first step. Networking can also be answering someone else's questions and being helpful to others. And networking can also be discussing a topic that you're passionate about that has maybe nothing to do with your work. Like for me, cooking. I know a lot about cooking and a lot about baking and sharing that information with others and commenting, you know, on posts or asking insightful questions on social media posts has led, you know, for me to have some pretty cool cookbook projects that I loved working on with big publishers and then hopefully I'll continue to get. So what makes it networking is how you connect, you know, how you help others and how you follow through by cultivating that connection and giving it the chance to develop into an actual relationship. So, you know, think about this presentation, think about the people you've met today, think about, you know, the conference that's coming up. How are you planning on cultivating those connections? And um, if you don't have a lot of ideas and you want more ideas, we have a whole blog post on, you know, preparing to go to a conference, going to the conference and what to do after you finish the conference. So how to follow up with those contacts and turn them into opportunities. And I think I have a link or it's on our blog on our website, but I think I have a link in the chat box that you can access. So let's talk about, you know, our goals, because once we start to redefine networking and we expand our, of our, our idea of what it can do for us, 
we also start thinking about what activities we can engage in with the networking mindset. So the next step is to, at least for us, to prioritize what are our business goals. And we know that goal setting can be an entire topic in itself, and it should be, but we want you know, to at least get that idea that you're networking because you have specific goals that you're trying to achieve. We want that to be on your radar so that you can build a network with purpose. And to do that, you need to know what your goals are and be clear. And, you know, it's not great to have 50,000 goals. Let's start with a couple of goals for the next month or the next quarter and, you know, build up from there. So we find that without the guides, the goals to guide you, your networking can be kind of aimless and it's a hit or miss journey that ends up, you know, using up your time and your resources and money and it leaves you feeling directionless. So our first step in productive networking is to identify our goals, which can then lead us to our networking efforts. So we like to think about the why behind our networking. When I say we, it's Brittany and me when we have all these conversations about networking, but we, you know, we think that to connect these goals to our networking, the best way is to ask ourselves a question. And that is what challenge can networking help us solve? Because we've discovered through EFA, through attending conferences, through holding, you know, socials about networking that it turns out in the publishing industry, we all have pretty similar goals. And we all face a lot of the same challenges. Like a lot of us want to increase our income every year. And most of us would like to maybe diversify our client list a little bit so that if, you know, one, one area or one genre kind of is like falling down or not selling as well, we're involved in another genre as well. Maybe we want to learn a new skill or get into a new niche. Maybe you want to connect with more readers or sell more books, or maybe we want to make our books accessible, you know, into other languages or get them into audio books. So it turns out that networking can help us meet each of these challenges and, and a lot of other, you know, great um, challenges that might not be related to specifically our line of work. So Brittany, back to you. Thanks. So um, exactly. And sometimes our professional needs go beyond these common business issues. Quite often editors and publishing professionals are freelancers and our careers and our work environments don't always conform to sort of traditional business settings or expectations. And a result of that is that often our work is enmeshed kind of in our personal lives, especially if you if you work from a home office you know what I'm talking about. Just like I mentioned earlier, cats invading my Zoom calls. Um, <laughs> this is one of those challenges that we have. But some of our goals, you know, may may revolve around bringing those two aspects um, of our work life and our more personal side into balance. For instance, you know, some of us um, are navigating medical situations or might be living with a chronic illness, and we might need to find creative ways of adjusting our work environment or our work hours to fit our circumstances. Or maybe we need to balance being a parent or a caregiver with being a full-time editor or cover designer. So just as networking can help you find your next client or your next vendor, co-author or reader, it can also help you navigate these more complex challenges so that you can meet your goals. Because as unique as our situations are, there are usually others who are dealing with the same issues or who have dealt with them. And these are people who can share their insights and resources and become part of this mutually supportive web that really is our network. So when we factor these goals and challenges into our networking, we can create a network that will help us thrive and succeed and really give us that spark. Okay, so if you're just starting out in publishing or even if you've been in this industry for a while, it may feel like you need to accomplish all the goals right now. And you probably feel like our friend here who is utterly overwhelmed <laughs> with all the, the things that you know, the blog posts that they've been reading and the great articles, all this information, all these wonderful things they need to be doing, but it's just overwhelming. Um, so Linda and I really recommend focusing on just a few main goals. And then we like to have like 
main goals and then building block goals that support those goals because it's really impossible to do everything well at once. So we, we always encourage and we try to take time to brainstorm, you know, to assess our options and to prioritize our needs. And it's also important to remember that, you know, while we might have similar goals as publishing professionals, we may each take a different path to get there. And that's okay. So often success stories that inspire us also can lead us to believe that there's only one right path. But being successful is about creating the path and the network that works specifically for you. So then, so this is where our emphasis on goal setting really comes together with our network building. And I know that often people don't think about goals as being part of networking. For many of us, goals are concrete, tangible achievements, and they're they're often measured with numbers. So maybe you want to increase your pay rate by 20% over the next year or two, or you know, reduce your admin time by 25% per client, or grow your newsletter list by 50%, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, you know, oftentimes with goals, we really like to quantify them. But in contrast, networking usually feels like a nebulous activity that we either engage in kind of haphazardly, um, like in a hit or miss fashion, or we can sign it to specific occasions like at a conference. So maybe every time you think to yourself, oh, I should be networking more. I need to have a stronger network. And then you remember, oh, I'm going to be going to this conference. I'll wait to do it then. <laughs> um, conferences are wonderful, wonderful opportunities to network. But as Linda mentioned earlier, that incremental kind of daily progress, it is huge. And that's really what, what we like to encourage. So instead of treating goal setting and networking as incompatible tools, we found that by combining them, it really amplifies their effectiveness. So when you're clear on your goals, they'll lead you to specific activities and spaces, which will put you in touch with the communities that share your professional interests. And that's really where you'll find people that you can connect with. And that's how you'll build the network you need at each stage of your career, because it does, our networks do evolve as we evolve and as our, our careers and needs change. Um, so when our approach to networking really ties in with our goals, it gives us that direction and keeps us on track. Okay, so now that we've established how goals and networking are connected, I'm going to address that little voice that some of us hear about right now. And that's the one that says, you know, oh, I don't know where to start. I don't have time for this. Um, but I want to share with you something that happened to me. It was it last year or the year before? I can't remember. I think it was maybe it was two, I, the COVID years are like a whole blur, but um, it happened in the COVID years. And um, I noticed, you know, in one of the volunteer mentorship programs that I run, I do one for the Professional Editors Network and one for EFA. And there was a new member that was asking questions about how to get clients. They weren't getting enough clients and they were kind of tired and kind of fed up because there was just, it was just really hard to get clients and get jobs. And I was surprised because we, I don't usually hear that from new members. And so I decided I'm just going to go look at her profile and see if I can help her maybe with customizing her profile or something. And I went to her directory profile and there was nothing there. It was completely blank. So then I emailed her and I said, you know, it's, I, I went to check your profile and I'm not sure what's happening, but there's nothing there. And she said that she hadn't completed her directory profile because she wasn't going to fake it until she, you know, I'm not going to fake it until I make it. And what she was saying was that she was waiting to build her editorial skills more and to get more experience before she put any information into her profile. And that response surprised me because this person had over 20 years of experience in different industries, and she was incredibly knowledgeable about technology and about building websites and the whole back end part of websites. So she definitely had something that she could bring to the table. The problem was, or the disconnect was, that she was expecting only to put her specific acquired editing skills once she had started using them. And instead, perhaps a better strategy would have been to mention this industry experience that she already had 
the skills that she developed over the years, you know, the software programs that she knew how to use, and what accomplishments she might have had at those jobs. She could have also listed the classes that she was currently taking, or if she had any other certificates that maybe were not specifically related to editing. But, you know, one of the things I admire about Brittany is Brittany's got the whole Kaizen thing down of that you learned at your previous job. And I'm always like, that's an amazing skill to have as an editor because it's how you organize a lot of your materials and your work. So all of this person's past was a lot of valuable information that was not showing up in her directory profile. And we need to remember sometimes that our past work experience really contributes to the type of knowledge that we have and that we bring to the table You know, when we're editing or writing. It might just be those experiences that catch the eye of a potential client and that open the door to a new project that you weren't aware of. Um, and I'm just going to say that for me, that was when I added that I had studied at the university in Argentina and that I had lived there for 12 years, that opened a whole new area of clients that were contacting me and contacted me to do review of Spanish translations. And I have no degree in editing specifically related to Spanish editing, but I do have journalism experience at university in Argentina. I'm fully fluent in the language in Spanish. I can write, you know, speak. And so now I've specialized also where I can copy edit in Spanish. And that wasn't something that, you know, eight years ago I thought about adding to my profile, but the minute I did, it really opened some new doors to some new clients that I had never thought about having before. So enough about me, Brittany, here, back to you. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, so now that we've talked about redefining networking and how it will help you build a stronger, more complete and more valuable network, it's time to get some perspective on your current network. So these are um, my two favorite worksheets from our workbook because these are the ones that gave me the reality check of where I was and why things sometimes weren't working for me. Um, the first one was my, you know, small trusted network. And I started filling this in and I was putting the names of the people that I interacted with often. And by the time I got to line five, I just had this huge like aha moment of, yeah, no wonder things aren't happening because you're connecting with the same people like you in your small trusted network. My connections were really limited. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I had tons of Facebook friends, I had, you know, contacts on LinkedIn, I had some Instagram followers. Um, I even have it, I have it somewhere around here, one of those, you know, 1980s booklet type business card holders where I keep, you know, all the business cards and I write on them, you know, where I met this person and what they do. But that was not enough. And that wasn't getting me the kind of work that I wanted to. So after I filled out both of these sheets, and I took a look at them, I realized, and Brittany kind of helped me with this too, that everybody was a lateral connection. It was, you know, I was connected with editors and people in the publishing industry that had the same level of experience I had. And my goals were somewhat different at the time. I knew that I needed to grow my network. I knew that I needed, you know, based on what I was seeing, some new insights, some fresh perspectives, some different perspectives and diverse perspectives. So I needed to network with editors who had been in this business in other areas of this business much longer than I had. Um, I also wanted to network though with some brand new editors who I could share what my experience of starting my own freelance business was like. And I could share that knowledge with them. And, you know, as well as what challenges I faced early on in my editing career. So when we started, you know, working on these sheets, my goal and specifically remember that year, my goal was to diversify my, my portfolio and work with a few of the bigger publishing houses because I wanted to branch out from working with um, specifically only indie authors. But again, all the people I was connecting with in my small and my broad networks were people who didn't work in the big publishing houses. So I needed to branch out and I needed to make some connections with project managers, you know, fact checkers, you know, acquisition editors, proofreaders things like that, who could at least share information about what the experience working in those industries was for them, how they got in, what they recommended. So once you feel out, you know, fill out these sheets at the bottom right here, these are some like secret, you know, mystery questions that will get you thinking more and take time to ponder those questions and see what comes up for you. 
And again, I just want to remind everybody that you will be getting, um, oh no, the copies of these worksheets you can download from the website for free as well. So they're in there um, and it's where, I think it's in the resources page. Oh, here's a link down here. So you'll be able to see them there. But, you know, after you've completed the worksheet, these are the kind of questions that you want to ask yourself. And what we find is that we tend to focus on some questions that aren't the most helpful, and we tend to focus on questions that create more stress than what they help. And so, you know, we tend to think of how many people liked my post. You know, it's never enough. Um, how many people commented? Never enough, usually. How many social media followers do I have? And is Jane Friedman following? Does, it, does everybody know who Jane Friedman is? If you don't, you should head over. You don't, Dave. Jane Friedman is like the publishing maven of books and editing and all amazing things so if you haven't followed her you definitely need to be following her and reading she has an amazing newsletter that comes out on saturday mornings that you just be prepared to explode because it's so nice <laughs> so um you know as so many things in life it's not really about the quantity it's about the quality of the communication that's taking place it's not about collecting a trove of superficial followers, but it's about connecting with real people and you know, cultivating these real relationships. So some of the questions that we like to ask ourselves are, who's missing in my network? And what can I give myself permission to try? You know, whether it be social media, whether it be communication, you know, a different form of communication. We really forget to ask ourselves most of the time, who could I be helping? And am I connecting or am I collecting? So the next time you want to hit that connect button on LinkedIn and you're just not going to write a note to someone, <laughs> I'm going to challenge you to think, am I connecting or am I collecting? And if I'm collecting, then maybe that's a pass on that person. But if you're trying to connect, write that note out, put a little note about how you met that person, why you wanted to connect, why it's important to you, because we all appreciate hearing that. So... This is what my revised network looked afterwards. I realized, okay, you know, small business owner, freelancer, I'm an author. What am I missing in my network? You know, where do I want my projects to go? And I needed to connect with more translators and I was able to do that. I needed to find, you know, a reliable graphic designer. And we interviewed a few people with Brittany and we found the one that was a right fit for us. Um, it was important for us to stay connected with inclusion and DEI specialists because they are able to bring to the table a wealth of information that me as an able-bodied person, I'm not paying attention to sometimes than I should be. So that was really helpful. EPUB accessibility coders. One of the things about our book that was really important for Brittany and for me from the get-go was that our code have the right level of coding on the back end so that anybody that had a visual impairment that was going to use a screen reader in the ebook for the ebook to read it, that it was going to properly read. And sometimes we forget that we go about and we create these ebooks and we're not testing them on screen readers to see what does it sound like on the other end and how is that reader perceiving it or hearing it. We needed, you know, a virtual assistant. I never thought I would use a virtual assistant. It's just not within my, you know, I hadn't planned for a budget for that. I did. And then I started using one to do the things that I really hated doing, like setting up my accounting and, you know, some databases that I needed to collect information for. And it was the best money spent ever because now I could focus on the work that I wanted to do where I would be making more money. And I would be able to pay that virtual assistant. And I, you know, she was an expert at what she was doing. And I'm specializing in what I'm doing. And everybody, you know, was happy. And I kept, my projects kept moving forward. The same thing, you know, social media content planner. I don't have one yet. I plan to find one and be able to add that to my, um, to my list. And a new thing that's come up for me based on some things that have been happening lately in the publishing world too, is having an online security expert look at my website, my backend, my social media, make sure that um, I don't even want to say the word unhackable, but, you know, making sure that I'm doing the best I can with my security measures. So, Okay, thank you, Linda. So then once we've determined who is in our current network and whom we're missing, just as Linda went through that exercise, um, you know, but once we know who we're missing kind of based on our goals and where we want to go and the kind of network we want to build, 
then we can take another step forward and start looking at how we personally like to network. Um, what is our personal networking style? And just as Linda loved the other two <laughs> worksheets, we we have lots of worksheets in our in our um, book because we really enjoy using them. We like the perspective that it gives us. So this is my favorite worksheet from the book. Um, not that we're having a contest about who, <laughs> which worksheet is best, but I think they're both great. Um, but so to to give us this perspective, we developed um, the self assessment worksheets, and this one is on our personal networking style. And so we all have, you know, different comfort levels and we have different communication styles. So what works for Linda, who is a bit of a ambervert, she's a little more extroverted than I am. Um, it might not be what works best for me. I'm really more of an introvert. And though I'm sure that you, know, you might be thinking, well, I know myself pretty well. I don't need to fill out a worksheet <laughs> to know <laughs> where my comfort level is. I still think that it's worth jotting down these things that you know about yourself so that you can look at your answers from a fresh perspective. Um, and after this presentation, you can um, you can go to our website if you want and download these for free, but you, you can then work through them on your own. But some of the questions that you might ask are, you know, what are my preferred ways to network right now? What have I been doing? Um, where do I feel most comfortable? Am I a face-to-face -face person? Do I like talking um, on the phone or on Zoom, or do I really feel better if I'm just communicating through email and chats and things like that? Do, do I feel more at ease? And then, let's Sorry. see, you're fine. Um, so then on the second half of the worksheet, we have the chance to think about the parts of networking that make us feel uncomfortable. For instance, does attending in-person events feel stressful right now? And, you know, based on kind of our last couple of years with COVID, and there may be a certain amount of just um, stress related to that, or we might just have a kind of a higher level of stress in general when it comes to in-person meetings. Um, if the idea of networking does make you feel anxious, what activities are you thinking about that are making you uncomfortable? Sometimes just as we go back to the idea of reframing networking, uh, if we can change how we see networking from being the uncomfortable things and think about, well, this also counts as networking and hey, I like to do this and I enjoy it. That's really part of what we're trying to kind of help you make that shift here. So if there are other more pleasant activities that you can see as networking now that you've reframed what it means to networking, but to, sorry, what it means to network, that can really help. And you know whatever your, your answers are in these worksheets, we always like to kind of emphasize here that there's no judgment. Your preferences are more than fine. The idea is just to be honest with yourself about these preferences, and then you get to treat them as one more data point to incorporate as you develop your own personal networking plan. So the point of the worksheet is really to recognize our networking comfort zone so that we can then make the most of it. And that also allows us to acknowledge what activities make us uncomfortable. So then we can be mindful about whether we want to try them out. You know, in some situations, it might be worth it. And you might say, well, this isn't really in my comfort zone, but I can see the value. So I'm going to give it a try. And at the same time, in some situations, it just may not be worth it. And I think it's really important to kind of give yourself that permission. So the, the concept though is, it's a really important part of how we like to approach networking. So I'll emphasize it one more time. When you're networking, it's important to honor who you are and how you are. What activities are a stretch for me? Can I give myself permission to try them on occasion? And can I refrain from them without guilt or self-criticism? And, and as a side note, this, um, this particular exercise is really good to do with a partner or a group because it gives you an opportunity, an opportunity to learn from other people's communication styles and their comfort zones. Um, Linda and I have done this together. And I think it also helps to sort of um, just increase your awareness and maybe empathy of how other people communicate because sometimes when we are in these social situations, we might not really know what's kind of going on um, 
sort of behind the scenes with people. And so when you understand, um, when you do one of these worksheets with someone, then I think that gives you sort of insight into to why some of us are maybe quieter <laughs> and some of us are more, you know, more extroverted and that it's all, it's, it's all good. It's just a matter of, um, of understanding and being kind to one another. So I'm going to like totally pause there and say, if you haven't read this book, if you're on the more introvert side, it's called Quiet, um, a phenomenal book, a lot of research, a lot of data about what, you know, not everybody who is quiet is unsuccessful, quite the contrary. Um, it has a really interesting thing about Anthony Robbins and <laughs> what what that's like to be in that presence. And, you know, that not, not everybody has to be an Anthony Robbins and, you know, we shouldn't thankfully all be like that. But that, you know, the quieter ones, the background usually are developing new ideas and doing a lot of things that we might not know about. So um, reach out to the quiet ones if you're a little bit more extroverted. Um, they have some great phenomenal insight most of the time. So not most of the time, I would say all of the time. So here we go. Another success story. And this is another totally true story. So the week that Networking for Freelance Editors came out, one of my colleagues here in LA, um, who actually lives a few miles away, um, she texted me and she said, you know, I've been getting this XYZ newsletter for 14 years um, by email and they have meetings every month and I've never participated in the meetings, but today I took a page out of your book and I joined a Zoom call. And you know what? It wasn't that bad. And this was all in a little text message, you know, on my screen. She said, you know, I met someone that who recently moved to the area and works, you know, in the same kind of industry that I work, which was, uh, by the way, curriculum editing for schools. So two days, I was like, oh, that's great. You know, awesome. I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. But then two days later, she texted me again and she said, you know what? I'm going to meet up for virtual coffee with this person. Um, I'm excited. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. Okay. You know, taking the relationship to the next level for virtual coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and then two days later, she texted me to say that they had a coffee, that it was great. And that this person was working for a company, freelancing for a company in their freelancer pool that my colleague had been wanting to work for forever. And this friendship continued to develop. And after a few more days, they were each other, they were checking each other's resume, they were checking their directory profiles. And in the end, my colleague within two months was able to book work with this other company through this person that she had met. So when, you know, that tiny, tiny step, which for my colleague was a big step of, you know, joining that online Zoom meeting that she had refused to join for 14 years made a huge difference. And it kind of dispels, you know, our preconception of how we think things are going to turn out or what we think of people or of a group of people and what we might have to gain. Because that connection that my colleague made that first night when she joined that Zoom call at that meeting, it was never supposed to be an instant friendship. It was never supposed to be, you know, a job opportunity. That's not why she joined or she, she never thought about that either when she joined. But what it turned out to be was a good, solid connection. Um, and they were able to share their thoughts about, you know, the industry with somebody else who worked in that industry so they could commiserate about things and get new ideas. That connection that my friend made could become a sounding board or somebody that they could consult with, you know, when a challenging project came their way because they both were the editing the same types of materials. And in a few weeks or months, it could have turned into a job, but it turned into a job much sooner than, than she had expected. So you never know. Maybe, you know, I sometimes think that maybe my friend was at that challenging period in her own freelance career where she just needed one person to connect with so that she could feel supported and less alone and above all understood because I don't know anything about school curriculum editing. So I don't know how supportive I've been to her over the years, but she found somebody who could help her with that and move forward. So if you think about it, the success stories that can stem from one connection are endless. And all it took was, you know, clicking on a Zoom link to join that meeting that night. So. Thanks, Linda. Okay, so, so the network that you need starts with you. And while many of us feel that, you know, we're in this alone because we think that our goals are unique or our situations are unique. And to some extent, of course, 
they are. Um, but we want to invite you to, to keep an open mind and to consider inviting others to join you on your journey. And just coming to this talk is a great start. And to go a step further, you know, maybe you'll think about attending some virtual and in-person conferences or maybe just smaller webinars or classes, um, or maybe the upcoming PPN conference in April. I know Alex Capitan um, of the Radical Copy Editor will be there. So that is an awesome reason to go <laughs> in and of itself. Um, but yeah, and so it's, you know, it's so much easier. Or we found it to be so much easier to move forward when you have people to talk to and brainstorm with colleagues who can encourage you when the going gets tough, but also hold you accountable and help you stay motivated to keep going because you are making progress. And also remember that, that sometimes you may be exactly who someone else needs in their network. Okay, so we're getting ready to wrap up right here. This is your call to action. After spending this time with us tonight, we hope you'll be motivated to redefine your idea of networking, to identify your business goals, the short-term ones and the long-term ones, to evaluate your current network and to discover what your personal networking style is and where you think you might be able to stretch it a little bit. Um, and if you do it with others, it's so much more fun and entertaining. And then the insight, you know, that you receive from other people sometimes can be so phenomenal to really encourage you to try new things or to learn something new. So we want you to start practicing and to consider attending the PBN conference. Um, the registration link is there, and I'm sure that Dave will put it on the box, um, in the chat box. But one last thing that I want to share about this network, and you never know how it's going to go. I've been, we've been talking about getting the book translated into Spanish for a while now for Spanish speaking editors. And I reached out to a colleague of mine in Argentina who happened to know someone who works at a publishing house. And today, let me show quickly here, we got our new cover for our book in Spanish, which is coming out in December. So we're really excited about that. Mm -hmm. Networking para editores. So. Wonderful. So then... Lynn and I just really want to thank you so much for joining us today and for kind of joining us on our networking journey. This really has been um, uh, a journey for us. We've been learning together for these years, and it's super important to us to, to share what we've learned because we understand how kind of isolated you can feel as an editor or as a freelancer or just as a person on this planet sometimes. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so we hope that you had fun today and that you learned something new. And we really hope that you're inspired to grow the network that you need that will support you and kind of just help you flourish. So we would, you know, we would love to hear from you. I've been trying to keep an eye on the chat box and I know that there are some really good questions and um, comments. So I just do want to invite you, um, if there are things that we haven't really fleshed out today that you would like to talk to us about, feel free to just drop either of us um, or both of us a line. We're happy to um, help any way we can. Uh, and our, our email or our, our kind of our joint email is info at networkingforeditors.com. Um, but I think Linda also provided our personal ones in the chat as well. And then if you'd like, you can visit our website. Uh, there are resources there that you can download for free, like all of the work, um, the worksheets from our book. And also we have a 25% off um, discount code specifically for PPN members. It's PPN 2023. Yay. Um, so in the chat and, box there, so. Yeah, and so that is if you go directly to our website, you can um, you can purchase either the ebook or the print book. Um, I think or you can just not purchase anything and download the sheets that you want to work on with your yeah. friends or your, your colleague and do that. Um, but we also have a list of all the different organizations that you can join or lurk on and learn about you know what people are doing whether it be the you know the mystery writers of america or rwa or you know so um the resources i think are really valuable to kind of expand that 
maybe there's other organizations you can be connecting with um, mm -hmm. where your clients are at and that you haven't thought about. So, okay, that's it. Dave, I'll pass it back to you or see if we have any questions or any cool networking stories. Well, first, first of all, let me just say thank you so much. It's such a great session. It got me thinking so much of ways that I personally can do um, a better job in terms of how I'm connecting with, but also like PPN, I'm like, oh my God, a welcome, a welcome th process, like a welcome community. How great is that? We don't even have that. So already. Yes, yes. You, know, you might have some volunteers. Yeah, you never yeah. know. Yeah. So hopefully by the, ne the next time you see me on video, I'm like, and welcome to our new welcome team. So um, so there have been some great uh, questions in, in the chat. Uh, uh, and, and, and I hope people um, are comfortable adding them now. Um, I don't know if you, um, both of you have had a chance to look at them. One of the things that I thought was really interesting in your discussion, and it kind of relates to some of the questions have raised, but you were talking about sort of lateral um lateral connections and how really trying to connect in air with people who would do different things than what you do and that is a big part of what ppn tries to do right we we, we don't just try to connect as a community but we even though we're a community of book builders whether that's editors designers and um proofreaders and all that kind of stuff but also we try to engage with people in in marketing and pr and distribution and stuff because it's really important that the different arms of the industry industry understand and connect with each other so they, they can really appreciate like oh this is why they do that thing this is why they do that and I think on a personal level that's really true too last at last year's um conference we had a great session on collaborating and not competing as freelancers and one of the great um panelists there um, basically recognized that she was a freelancer but she wanted to form a business that was a cooperative where they could offer a much broader package to the clients and they all worked together so that they could offer editorial project management indexing web design all that stuff and they worked together and it was a great way and and of course they had to figure out that connecting part to make that happen and so i love that but one of the things in the questions uh in the chat one of the questions was you know the hows of uh how do we connect when we have um, lots of struggles, anxiety around this stuff. And I think that that's when there's also that the lateral is great. And people have talked about in the chat about, so for instance, I know that there's a great group of people who are like on the spectrum and they they have a great way of sharing with each other about how do we connect with other, you know, how do we get more work and how do we navigate this you know weird social yet professional world and it's a great way where the same coming together can be a great way to connect and then the different can also there's sort of the interesting dichotomy and I don't know if you want to talk at all about that I know when um, I'm like dying to jump in here can I <laughs> Brittany can I jump on on this one um I want to share my screen quickly because I think a lot of, and we, this is a, a handout that um, PPM will have that they'll send to you too, or that you can download. But one of the things that works for us is to do like some pre-conference prep or pre-meeting prep. And I learned that um, because a member of EFA told me one day how much she liked that every time I was going to host a social, I was, I would put the questions that I was going to ask. And I never did that thinking. I just thought it would be helpful to know what you wanted to say at the meeting. But um, she mentioned to me how helpful that was to know ahead of time what was going to be asked of her so that she could write it out and practice at home and then say it. And I really feel that I need people to tell me that. I want other editors to tell me that. I want other people to say, like, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable with this. So this is what I do instead. Or you could you please help me? And could you please say this, you know, at the next meeting? And so it helps me to understand how to carry some of the meetings that we have. But I'm going to share my screen to show you this doc that I feel is really helpful, um, which is what we call the pre-conference prep, prep. And it's, you know, when you're about, you're thinking about networking, you know, think about, is it going to be in virtual or in person? And, you know, have I been there before? What's the location like? And then more importantly, why do I want to go? And if I go, what am I hoping, you know, to promote or what am I hoping to get from the conference? And think about also, again, you know, what you're giving back, what kind of knowledge do I have that I can share with other participants? 
So things like this, I feel help me do all the, you know, mental download of what causes me anxiety is, you know, and stress. Um, don't think that doing this presentation five minutes before we started, I wasn't like, okay, let's breathe because, but I know, you know, I, I fill out this stuff. I do the work so that I'm prepared when the time comes that I need to be speaking, but that's my take. I don't know, Brittany, if you have something else that you want to share. Yeah, Linda. And I also, I was reading some of the, um, the chat notes about, um, you know, how to, to the difficulties or the challenges of networking um, when you have mental health struggles or when you have other things that are just one more kind of thing in your way. <laughs> and, and I really, um, I really appreciate people sharing that um, because I think to me, it's, it's super important to talk about. Um, you know, I think, so I, as an editor, I've been, let's see, I've been a full-time freelance editor for a bit over 12 years. And I would say for the first uh, five or <laughs> plus years, I really didn't have a lot in the way of a network. I was, I mean, I was a member of um, several editorial organizations. I was on the forums. I was in, you know, editors' Facebook groups and things like that, but um, I still felt kind of isolated. And as I mentioned before, I'm um, I'm more introverted, and talking in front of people and things like that um, has has always given me a lot of anxiety. So, um, but for me, kind of what what helped me was I actually met um, a fellow EFA member when I was volunteering. And we, Linda and I, we didn't really talk about volunteering today, but that is something that um, I think, well, I'll talk about it right now really quickly. Um, so for me, I was volunteering for an editorial organization and I met um, Sangeeta Mehta, who was, she basically started the diversity initiative at the EFA. And this was before she had started it. And she told me about her idea. And I said, that's something that we really need. And I was living on the West Coast at the time. She was in New York. She was where like the headquarters are. And so I said, you know, I'm all the way over here, but I will support you because I really believe in this. So tell me what I can do and I will I will be there for you. And um, that is really when my network started to, I started to build it without even really knowing what I was doing because I started volunteering for that and for um, other parts of um, the organization, but mainly for the diversity initiative. And because I was involved in something that I really cared about, I was able, I pushed myself to, to do it even when I was nervous and uncomfortable because I, I felt the value of what I was doing. And that really, that whole experience led to me meeting Linda and it led to um, me meeting um, another few editors who are in our mastermind group. And it's just, it's a little bit by little bit. And yes, sometimes we have to be in uncomfortable situations <laughs> and we have to kind of, I think of it as kind of not just staying in my comfort zone, but kind of pushing out the boundaries of my comfort zone a little bit at a time. So I understand that we all have different challenges. And so what I, my experience may not be applicable to other people's, but um, I think that you can, you can do it. And that there are people who this industry I've found to be very supportive and generous. And so sometimes you just have to look for those people who you think you might have some kind of a little connection with and just try it out. And um, I want to let you know, you can always email me and Linda and we will be happy to, to do whatever we can and to kind of get you started. We'll be there for you. So I know that's kind of a broad statement, but I mean, I had, I think both of us have had people who've been there for us. And so that's part of what our work here is about is just being there for other people as well. Yeah, and I'm just going to add that I tally this up. The best, the most profitable profitable projects I worked on in the last two years came from referrals from people that I met while volunteering, who I worked with on a different project, who saw my work ethic, who learned about what kind of editing I did and what my areas of expertise were. And so when somebody 
reached out to them for a project. They passed my name on and I got the project. So um, that's just a true fact that volunteering is your superpower. We all underestimate how much we can um, benefit from volunteering, maybe not immediately, but also down the road and how much how enjoyable the experience is when we are giving back and we are helping other people, even if it's with like, you know, just hearing somebody out on a call and answering a question or, you know, giving some, you know, resource information that sometimes it's not about what we know, but can we help the other person get to the information they need? Can we do that together? So that helps too. Uh, yeah, obviously, you know, PPN, we're all volunteers. And so volunteering is a big part of our organization in terms of how people engage. I also think, you know, um, lots of us, when when we enter an, like an in-person networking potential situation, it's like we go into a room, there are a bunch of people. And even though I think I'm a pretty extroverted person, depending on my mood or whatever, sometimes I just want to just stand in the corner. And if someone wants to come up to me, maybe that's okay, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go out there and do that. But Vaughn, the great thing about volunteering is you've got something to do, right? You've got this, you're given a task, uh, or you 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 realize here's here's something that I can contribute, and you're doing this thing, and then you realize, like, oh, I've really been engaging with potential colleagues and, you know, and, and maybe even clients, uh, you know, and having great conversations with them about things. Um, so I, I feel like volunteering has this both very direct sort of professional connection thing, but there's also for those of us who kind of struggle, you know, feeling like this feels fairly forced and contrived. Um, I'm put in a room with a bunch of people I don't really know that well. It gives you this thing, this vehicle to to kind of connect with people. And I think that's a, that's a great one as a, as well. So I'm a big, big volunteer supporter. So I don't know if you have more. Yeah. And, and then from an organizational perspective, there's nothing more amazing than getting an email from somebody saying, hey, I would love to help. And so if that's your thing, if you just in person, maybe does it work? Email somebody. There is there is so much stuff that needs to get done in all these volunteer organizations. So uh, there's always something you can help with. And it's also something. One, one thing I like about volunteering is that it's something that you can do both as like a veteran in an industry or as a newcomer. Because I think a lot of times people who are especially like new editors, they may feel like, well, I don't know enough or I don't have enough experience. The thing is that whenever you volunteer, you're doing something that that needs to be done and and you don't have to have that level of experience. You just have to have kind of that willingness to help. So I think that makes it really easy or accessible for more people because you don't have to be a specialist where volunteers are so welcome and the work they do is so important. So. And I love that someone said in the chat, you know, and, and, and that you said that in general, the pub publishing is made up uh, of people who are really just wonderful people to connect with. But if you're volunteering, it also puts you in this other level of these are people who are giving. You're working with other volunteers who are doing great things and, and having a fun time doing it. I, I often say... Um, at, at publishing uh, a professionals network, like if it's not fun and enjoyable, why are we doing it? Like it, it really should be fun. And I think we do a pretty good job of making sure that that happens. But we also have sessions like this, which are not only fun, but super informative. So thank you so much. Um, we're at 645. I don't know, I've been sort of skimming the chat um, to see if there are questions that we haven't answered, but it, it feels like you've covered so, so much. And I want to make sure that everyone understands that everything that has been referenced in terms of resources, links, and everything um, will come to you via email. Like the links will come via email after this. But also when we post the video, give us a couple of days, please. Uh, when we post the video, um, they'll, it'll be in the description as well. So we'll, we'll make sure that we have um, all, all of that. So, and I see that one of my colleagues, one of my volunteer colleagues has put um, all of, a lot of that information uh, in the chat. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any last words before we go, the two of you? No, if there's anything that you wanted to say that you just couldn't muster up to say today, you have our email address, reach out to us. If you have a cool networking story, reach out to us. If there was something that we said that just didn't jive, reach out to us and let us know so we can change it for next time. So it's been really nice seeing all these faces and especially like on an evening like tonight. So thank you so much for having us as guests tonight. It was a lot of fun. 
And, uh, you know, I, I asked people to do a shout out of where they're uh, joining us from in the chat, all over the world. It's amazing. Everywhere. So that's always exciting to see. Um, and uh, again, if you're interested in joining Publishing Professionals Network, uh, www.pubpronetwork.org. We've also put it in the chat and you'll get it in the email and everything. Um, it's a great organization and a great way to continue this conversation as well. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you. Good night.